friends, I'm tempted to invite Jim Wetzel to give this lecture after that. <laughs> it's an honor to deliver the St. Augustine lecture. Uh, I greatly admire Nova and the Augustinian Institute. For many years, I felt welcome here. I consider this place a, a second academic home. Grateful for its willingness to, to graft a mere Protestant ethicist onto the vine of Augustinian inquiry, now enlivened here by Vincent Boyd's Center for Political Theology. The work that's done in this place represents a kind of dialogical Christian humanism that we desperately need in our polarized age. So especially, let me thank Jim Wetzel, who is my rabbi for all things Augustine, and Anna Matsurak for helping put this event together. We're gonna do some time travel. I have a nine and 11 year old, so we do a lot of time travel in their reading. I'm gonna try to carve a channel, borrowing from Robert Marcus, from the fifth century to our contemporary moment. The theme of history and politics is ambitious. And it's a familiar one. There's a vast literature just within Augustine's studies. Given Augustine's effort to understand time, creation, and the historical career of the Civitas Permixta and the most glorious Kiwitas Dei, living by faith, a heavenly city that wanders among the ungodly. Opening of the city of God. That literature is usually focused on the much debated question of the secular. Augustine is sometimes credited with discovering the inner self in his book Confessions and discovering a notion of secularity in the city of God. But what does that mean? Augustine rejects cyclical history through a linear universal history scheme of fulfillment and salvation where time is running out. But I hope to say a few things tonight that are perhaps more strange than some of the familiar arguments, especially given the perhaps surprising renaissance of political theology across the academy today, and renewed calls to relate the historical and the normative fancy word for a philosophical discussion. My primary claim can be stated rather simply. The return of political theology invites another mode of theological inquiry that once figured prominently, especially in the period, the trans-war period of the 1930s through the 1950s. In fact, that period has been called an Augustinian revival of interest in the meaning of history. Think of Reinhold Niebuhr's The Nature and Destiny of Man, of Balthazar's A Theology of History. It was a Protestant, Orthodox, and Catholic phenomenon responding to the crises of their age, the shattering of their worlds, not unlike perhaps the loss of cultural ideals after the fall of Rome. It had remarkable Jewish analogies in figures like Jakob Talbus and Franz Rosenzweig. And in their work, they often highlighted the political edge of eschatology, considering the last thing, the end of history. But as Kevin Hughes has pointed out, today we often dismiss or ignore the theology of history. And I might add, the secular twin, the philosophy of history. A project often pursued in relation to theology and crystallized in a famous <coughs> debate between Karl Lowe and Hans Blumenberg about the meaning of secularization after World War II. If you haven't read that debate, Augustine plays star witness in negotiating what another figure, Karl Schmidt, argued was an analogical claim that all concepts of modern political thought are secularized theological 
philosophical inquiry into the meaning of history has had revivals in certain episodes. But today, I think it's mainly become a primary historical interest. I taught a course on it. Some students are here last year at Princeton. I don't think I've been taught in 50 <laughs> years when I asked some of my older colleagues. Part of my effort tonight is itself historiographic to recall this moment when modernity and periodizing history became a disputed religious category to suggest our relation to theorizing today. Theologies of history, philosophies of history were very much in the air when the English Roman Catholic and Hungarian immigrant, Robert Marcus, <coughs> launched a thousand ships, or at least articles and monographs, with his construal of how Augustine's politics was determined by a conception of sacred and secular history, primarily distinguished in terms of their relation to the gift of prophecy. Sacred history could be known because it was expounded in the prophetic literature of the Bible. Sacred history, secular history is something else. Our circumstances have changed. If theology is no longer animated by a theology of history or confidence in divine providence, political theorists, especially under the pressure of post-colonialism and skepticism, about historical progress, given its racialized and capitalist dimension, have largely abandoned a teleological approach to history, one that once was wedded to a confident idea out of the Enlightenment that we live in a secular time, and we need to disenchant politics, to purge the apocalyptic danger of religion, in fact, those uh, teleological approaches are often now seen as complicit with a Protestant hegemony that we are also needing to discard. I think in ways that actually resonate with Augustine, progress is now associated with the language of domination. Just as the politics of time and collective memory and the histories we tell and their Christian heritage are important topics in the history departments, but also school boards in Florida and around kitchen tables in America today. The response to the earlier efforts to have a philosophy of history often meant criticism in the form of modernity criticism and solicited Augustinian polemics against what was seen as prideful Kantianism. But even Kant's modest hope in what he called the winks and nods of providence that give us hope, maybe a hopeful pessimism. Or John Rawls, another important political theorist, deeply influenced by his reading of theology, as an undergraduate at Princeton, he abandoned his Christian faith, but still held to a moral faith in the possibility of justice a just society. He called it a realistic utopia. But even those modest hopes, let alone the more grand ones of Hegel or Marx, seem fabulous to my deeply moralized but melancholy undergraduates, who often have little sense of agency in a world of hurt, cruelty, and systemic injustice. It's hard to find Niebuhr's children of the light these days. Their myth is perhaps less Prometheus, more Sisyphus. I'm going to return to that predicament again. For now, I want to return to Professor Hughes, who writes, it is incumbent upon Christian theology to take up once again difficult questions in the theology of history, particularly in an apocalyptic key, precisely because it has been deployed as a weapon of destruction in just the ways our popular culture has come to fear. 
Some of my students get nervous when Christians say, I'm going to love you. They get even more nervous when Christians think the world is about to end and here's what we must do to accelerate. But the apocalyptic imaginary is back on the left and the right. Certainly in certain quarters of theology, especially radical political theologies, in the kairos of the now, but also our actual politics. Declarations of crisis, emergency, decay. Not to mention climate change. These exist alongside renewed debates about what is the secular or secularization, where invocations of Augustine loom large. In his work, Hughes has tried to discipline the terminological anarchy around the apocalyptic and the eschatological. In some discussion, Augustine has a reputation as an anti-apocalyptic thinker, but very much a pro-eschatological thinker. He would spiritualize the apocalyptic themes of the Bible to make them about the present, not the future. He would desacralize and demystify and de-divinize history and politics in order to help us see the world more clearly and truthfully. On one reading, he wanted to free history of the burden to be messianic after the coming of Messiah. It's not our responsibility to make history turn out well. The Messiah has come. Don't invest your energy into thinking fundamental questions of spirituality are a part of your politics. We should have nothing to do with the reverent silly myths, 1 Timothy 4, 7. Instead, we should stretch out, groan, wait toward the future of God's promised redemption, like the striking image of the poster for this lecture. But in ways that elude our ability to narrate <coughs> politics in a common world. The only politics on this reading that there is is the politics of Eden and the politics of Calvary. And they repeat themselves again and again and again. Some read this as redemption from history rather than redemption in history. As Carl Lowith controversially put it in his book, The Meaning of History, after the Christ event, the history of the world has for Augustine no intrinsic interest or meaning. After Augustine, a prominent uh, historian, well, in our day, modern period, not right after Augustine, but because of Augustine, Arnico, Arnaldo Lomigliano said, Christians invented ecclesiastical history in the biography of the saints. They did not try to Christianize ordinary political history. I once went to a talk here two summers ago, and a, a very prominent Augustine scholar, Jillian Clark, gave a talk on Augustine and history. And I asked her, how can an Augustinian write history? And she said, you don't. Or at least you can't confidently. And the only genuine history we know is the prophetic writing. In a, a recent article, Bernard McGinn said, the true history of the world is the hidden history of love. I think one uh, consequence of that might be is when we do write history, we need to write it from below. We need to write it about characters who do not get all the attention in the fancy history. <coughs> In doing this, like many early modern liberal thinkers and latter-day political realists, Augustine is thought to tame and redirect apocalyptic revolutionaries by way of deflating through an eschatological perspective that locates the sacred in the transcendent divinity. It leaves politics to the fallen, fragmented, eminent time of vitiated peace and justice. That we make use of, City of God, 19.6. But all the real action has either already happened in Christ or 
it's going to happen after the close of this year. Now, my archive tonight will be more limited and more modern than Hughes and other learned historians of the long array of Christian thinking about the relationship between literal readings of the scriptures and spiritual readings of the scriptures, and also of the dynamic of the penetration of the Christian gospel into the wounds of history under the sign of the cross. My goal is to inspire a contemporary Augustinian approach to politics that is more theological, more biblical, and more political. One that challenges my fellow so-called Augustinian liberals, who tend to rely mainly on Augustine's anthropology, his account of human nature, and have a negative political theology for every one of uh, what used to be Obama's yes we can, Augustinians say no we can't. <laughs> I want to attach that to a notion of eschatology and ecclesiology that Augustinian liberalism sometimes doesn't have. But I also want to spur a coalition broader than just an academic one. Those sad and dispirited people wary of the return of the gods, the anti-liberal right of Christian nationalism and integralism, and end times Christians storming capitals, shredding constitutions. Part of my claim, consistent with Hughes, is that the tragic wisdom of Augustinian realism is insufficient for our moment. It needs to be supplemented by an apocalyptic imagination. <coughs> However, Augustinians should resist the terms on which this is sometimes articulated, where the rupture of apocalyptic inbreeding, the invasion in time at the cross, and the acceleration of final judgment is pitted against a salvation <coughs> historical story that unfolds in the vast river of time, as Augustine said. The important part of that unfolding for Augustine has to do with the gathering of Israel and the Gentiles. And one of the reasons why I want to dislodge that binary of apocalyptic versus salvation historical is given Augustine's commitment to the goodness of creation, law, and his Christological reading of Paul and the Hebrew Bible a resource that I think political theologians have largely left to exegetes and historians of doctrine. So for now, let me just stipulate this provocation. Political theology is, in large part, parasitic on an account of history. And Augustinians would do well to bring together these two long-studied topics, Augustine on the status of history and Augustine on the status of politics because they've been isolated and frequently disparaged aspects of his legacy. <coughs> to complicate this marriage of history and politics, I add a third contested category, myth. Like conceptions of history, myth was central to provocative enlightenment stories about disenchantment. We need to abandon <coughs> mythic politics that escapes history for a more rationalist, and therefore more realist and responsible approach. Now Augustine was no rationalist of this kind, but he was, and has been called, a demonologist. He unmasked the seductions of the earthly city, its idealizing historians and philosophers and politicians. In fact, so great is his admiration for Plato that at the end of the city of God, he agrees with Cicero that Plato must have been speaking in fun with his myths. In the end, by contrast to the pagans, the city of God is not a myth. It is a people. The church triumphant, the Thomas Christus. The story of this people is being written in time by the Holy Spirit, conforming to the image of the Son the firstborn among many brothers and sisters, Romans 
And if you browse learned journals of Augustine studies, you find Augustine who demythologizes evil, demythologizes wealth, demythologizes sex, demythologizes the wise man, demythologizes capitalism, whiteness, mass incarceration, neoliberalism, the church, the trinity, history, and Paul. That's a long list, many people in this room. But we should remember, this is an important point, Augustine's critique of men as the factory of idolatry comes from within, not from without. His historical method borrows extensively from counterfeit mythology of his view, of the grammarians and the rhetoricians in his reading of the classics. And this is in part, I think, because he thinks an account of history needs a narrative form beyond chronology. Moreover, Augustine's critique always had constructive aims for the aspirations of the human spirit, especially after the fulfillment of the law through the love in the incarnation. And he discerned not only demonic, but Christological patterns, albeit veiled in history by uncertainty. Sometimes we say the first part of the city of God is the critical part, the second part is the constructive part. They're interrelated. But Augustine did want to provide for an anxious culture, something to live for, here and now, not just something to stand against. Now, myth is a term that once exercised scholars of religion a great deal, especially in the history of religion school. Think Eliade and Lincoln. <coughs> not so long ago in my graduate seminars, although it was much longer ago for some of you, we would talk a lot about myth. Of course, it's prominent in figures as diverse as Freud, Nietzsche. <coughs> Weber, Levi Strauss, Heidegger, Paul Ricoeur. Many in religious studies still embrace myth as a category, especially the social function of myth. Not so much what it is, but what it does. They play on a double meaning of the word myth, not just something false, but myth as something that is culturally richer and more psychologically revealing than history has streamed together a bunch of facts. By my legs, myth has fallen by the wayside in religious studies as terms like ritual, affect, practice, not to mention belief, have gained ascendancy in religious studies. Post-Kantian philosophy often has imagined itself as a liberation from ethical thinking. In political theory, especially under the influence of Anglo-American analytic philosophy, Myths are associated with the irrational and the unscientific, the obscure and the ideological, despite what many scholars of mythology have argued. We often associate this view of myth with modernity and modernization, aligned with what many Augustinians might diagnose as the Pelagian myth of progress. But its roots are much deeper. Receptions of Socrates and Socratic philosophy have themselves been described as a movement from mythos to logos, a rational and critical enterprise divorced from myth. Despite the well-known fact that Plato deliberately interlaced his philosophical writings with his own myths. In her recent book, Plato and the Mythic Tradition and Political Thought, Taeyun Kyung powerfully charts the history of this tent, an uncertain legacy, pointing to figures like Thomas More and Leibniz and Schelling and Herder, who also deploy myths in their philosophical and political thinking. She calls political theorists to reckon more honestly with this fact, both as a matter of Plato interpretation, but more ambitiously as the very story that political theory tells about itself. On her view, the problem of myth is inescapable because we are storytelling animals. Mythological thinking is entwined with philosophy itself. It's not beyond reason, or it's not just condescendingly 
for the cynical manipulation of the masses. Far from anti-democratic, she argues, a more inclusive politics in our day should open itself to myths. It is ultimately more vulnerable and more ambitious than a politics that tries to shut them out. I think those who admire Augustine's religion of fishermen might find this call to the In biblical studies, of course, myth has a history. <coughs> Perhaps especially given Rudolf Boltman's program of demythologizing the New Testament in the wake of the Great War, the crisis of liberal Protestantism. That program no longer grips the theological world in the way it once did. Myth talk has so much baggage. A curious mix of Eurocentric polemic, myth as irrational, and Orientalist nostalgia. Myth is so meaningful. We stop talking about myth and turn to story and narrative, as in post liberal theology, or worldview, as in post Kantian philosophy of religion or social imaginary, as in secular study. Recent biblical scholarship, including the apocalyptic turn in Pauline studies, begun by Boltman's student, Ernst Kossiman, radically challenges the Lutheran distortions brought by Boltman's existentialist theology of judgment and grace, which is thought to erase the narrative of Israel, the flesh of Jesus, the life of the church, and the demonic powers of the world. In fact, the rise of political theology, especially in Europe, might be told in terms of a reaction to Boltmann's existentialized eschatology. Some Boltmann scholars have argued vigorously that Boltmann was not all. An apologia that I think Augustine scholars, burdened by our own caricatures of a saint who was an individualist, who retreated into the interiority of his soul distended in time, should have some initial sympathy. It's always more complicated. And there's an interesting wave of efforts to revisit demythologizing afresh, more charitably, less polemically, as a vital theological and pastoral strategy for Christians in their ever-renewed attempt to articulate what faith is trying to say in response to the message of Christ crucified and risen. They point to the soteriological function of demythologizing to strip away the accretions of mythical discourses of ancient culture that are alien to the plausibility structure of the modern believer and distorts our God talk in the same way that for Boltmann and for Kossemann and for Karl Barth, the myth of German nationalism and the Third Reich block the hearing of the gospel. Demythologizing is a theologically driven version of ideology critique. It's an effort to translate that message of the gospel without conflating it to our culture. To borrow from James Wetzel in a different context in his reading of Kant's reading of Genesis, we debunk stories we hoped about grow like the one about the tooth fairy. We demythologize the ones we go to carry with us in some transformed way into adulthood. On Wetzel's reading, the line between demythologizing and remythologizing is often difficult to draw. When I shared the title for this lecture with one of my Augustinian liberal friends, he thought I'd gone crazy. Remythologizing? I take some comfort in Wetzel's blurring of the line here. Boltmann cited Augustine in his New Testament mythology. He claimed that unless our existence is moved by the question about God, in the sense of Augustine's, thou hast made us for thyself, our heart is restless until it rests in thee, we would not be able to recognize God as God in any revelation. In fact, there were efforts in the 1940s and 1950s largely unread today, by students of Baltman to recruit Augustine's De Doctrina Christiana to their teacher's talk. Revisiting Baltman today is bound up with conceptions of history and eschatology, including the salience of the apocalyptic, for living into the new creation through the power of the Spirit, living into God's promise to defeat slavery, to sin, and 
Demythologizing is a recontextualizing effort to undo what Hans Frey called the eclipse of the biblical narrative. A book preoccupied with myth, history, and a post-critical, figural interpretation of the Bible. Like Wetzel, Charles Matthews paradoxically suggests in his own book on demythologizing Augustine on evil, which follows Boltmann's student, Hannah Arendt, argues that demythologizing needs itself to be demythologized, because we cannot escape myths without escaping ourselves. I take this to mean that Augustine's eschatology does deflate politics, but it's an epistemic deflation, not a, a historical one or metaphysical one. Augustine, for all his drunk, for all his self-involved interiority, for all his playful biblical allegorizing, which I love, his reading of the Good Samaritan is not the Massachusetts Democrat Party platform reading of the Good Samaritan, where you can do good to everybody. It's a rich discussion of all the characters signifying what I call mythical things. For all of his sense of the plasticity of time-bound language, for all of his communal effort to read scripture together, Augustine was not Paul. That's true even if Boltmann was not Paul. How he might have responded to the historical critical method that detaches the charisma of Jesus from the world picture of the biblical text is above my paper. There's a great difference between their approaches, notably in the role of the church and the status of the Bible itself. Though I think they might be closer to, other, to each other than to other trends in modern biblical scholarship that unbundles the text from the spiritual condition of the interpreter. Augustine and Boltmann did push against a preoccupation with what Boltmann described as pictures of the end of currents that fix the end of time chronologically. Augustine was attracted to millennialism early in his career, but he would come to reject it by the time of the writing of the City of God. In Book 18, he tells us that we search in vain to define the years that remain for the world. Christ commands all who make such calculations on this subject, and I love this, to relax their fingers and let them rest. Stop trying to count when the end of the world's going to come. Why? Because Christ commanded us, it is not for you to know the times. This agnosticism about reading apocalypticism in history, be they wars, the rise and fall of empires, pandemics, has become a hallmark of contemporary political Augustinianism. Even as the consequences of Augustine's eschatological views, I think, have not been outlined by scholarship in great detail. It has presentist and futurist dimensions. Brian Daly has characterized it as a kind of realized eschatology, that we hover between the already and the not yet. Carla Pullman herself argues that Augustine turns the apocalyptic imagery into a kind of Christian myth, or hermeneutical frame of reference that reinforces ethical behavior by learning from the future already now. She admits Augustine holds together a little literal reading of the New Testament against origin and a spiritual one against the millennium. It puts our fulfillment, the separation of good and evil, the final persecution after the end of time when we return to God's eternal presence. As she pithily puts it, Augustine wanted to have his apocalyptic cake and eat it too. For Pullman, Augustine's eschatology re-mythologizes Revelation. It emphasizes that its events are happening repeatedly throughout history. The hidden ways of providence are Augustine's practical doctrine of consolation and hope. It's usually his get-out-of-jail-free card when people push him on the problem of evil. One of our most recent discussions of Augustine's political rhetoric, Michael Lamb's A Commonwealth of Hope, might be read, among other things, as a sustained extension of the claim that Augustine's eschatological grammar of hope, structured between presumption and despair, serves as a pedagogy of encouragement against the otherworldly pessimistic interpretations of 
If Lamb's book can be read as a Republican variant on Augustinian liberalism, dialogue with political theory, embracing the temporal goods that we share with non-Christians, cultivating civic and theological virtue, it appears Augustinian liberals want to have their secular cake and eat it. <coughs> Augustine was not a secularist. He lived in a sacramental world of demons, spirits, the Holy Ghost. There was a cosmic struggle in his right that our efforts sometimes to secularize him too much miss. He lived in a world, we would say today, of multiple temporalities, determined by confidence in divine providence and the word of God that allowed his heart to rise above time. Even as he transformed the platonic ascent by emphasizing a God who bends down into time and makes all of us equidistant from God. He and Monica, in their talking, their panting, just touch the edge of time. Confessions not. Later, Augustinians like Jonathan Edwards would refit this piety to imagine special outpourings of the Spirit as part of God's historical work of redemption that would make things even better than they were at creation. There's an image Augustine has of uh, we are like being slingshotted down by the fall, but caught and brought up. Because we have bodies, we don't fall all the way down like the angels. Now, despite all these literary illusions in Augustine, in the war, the quarrel between poetry and philosophy, he was very much on the side of philosophy. He could say begrudgingly that the poet shouldn't be completely disregarded the country of the At his most liberal, Augustine would claim that all truth is God's truth wherever you find it. He took aesthetic delight in the struggle to interpret them. He was an African, a Roman, a Platonist, a Christian. He thought with men, fighting fire with fire sometimes. He wrote about Rome's founding, the rape of Lucretia, the dream of Scipio, the myth of her, the kidnapping of the Sabine women, Venus in the marriage bed, Virgil's Aeneas, just to be they make for Augustine's version of the 1619 project. He retells the myths to demythologize them. The myths especially of founding the nostalgic whitewashed histories of the empire that hide the truth of its domination. It's surprising that given the prominence of references to demythologizing and Augustine's significance in semiotics, that myth itself has not been a prominent feature of Augustinianism. Augustinian studies. Sadly, Father Allen, it finds no entry in the magisterial Augustine through the ages. Or indeed, the multi volume Augustine Oxford Guide to the Historical Reception of Augustine. In both cases, M ends with mysticism. The Augustinus lexicon ends with mysterium. There have been efforts, daring ones, to think myth and Augustine. Notably, James Wessel's, uh, Wetzel's essays on myth and metaphysics and myth and moral philosophy. But myth and politics, we all know where that leads. The romance ends in blood. Somebody else's cross. In Ernst Cassirer's famous phrase, the political myths of the 20th century were manufactured in the same sense and according to the same methods of any other modern weapon as machine guns. Placing the border between myth and politics under the banner of public reason can be read as one of the most important strategies of liberalism against fascism. <coughs> to quote one example, Jürgen Habermas says, the rationalizing process of the modern world requires us to abandon mythical worldviews and convert myth into norms that allow criticism such that the spell-binding power of the holy is sublimated into the bonding force of criticizable validity games. If you've never heard of Jürgen Habermas, don't worry about it. If you have, it's a revealing passage. Now, Augustinian liberals, like myself, have challenged more austere forms of public reason that try to sanitize all politics of any religious speech. It's hard to imagine American democracy without religious speech. 
But they tended to share the antipathy to myth as false consciousness. Uh, Peter Brown, a great Augustine scholar, once told me the problem with contemporary Augustinianism is that it is too demythologic. Augustine, like Plato, has been deployed as the great demythologizer, as we have seen, and often, mostly, of other people's myths. References to writ of myth, be they Greek, Latin, or Persian in his writings, are nearly always negative. Myths are glittering, long-winded, absurd, shameful, blasted, superstitious, <coughs> the realm of lies. Whatever intimations of goodness philosophers had, were constrained by their myths. He was a zealous Catholic convert. He likened his education in myth, especially the myth of Manichaeism, to the food of pigs in the parable of the Good Samaritan, I mean, the prodigal son. He could admit the fables of the schoolmasters and the poets, the verses of Medea in flight, are more wholesome than the myths about the five elements metamorphosed to defeat the five caverns of darkness. Confessions for Mythical theology, aligned with theater and poetry, is condemned primarily for its corrupting influence <laughs> on a lustful civic theology. John Cavadini has shown, especially in the also seldom read books 15 through 18, Augustine cannot recount the history of empires without referencing their myths. Even the myths they themselves did not believe. According to Cavadini, the story of the city of God is the prophetic denunciation of myth. Quote, it is the anti -myth. Now, Cavadini doesn't quite put it this way, but maybe we could say with C.S. Lewis, it is the true myth. The Bible's story of sacrificial love of Christ and his church demythologizes the confused, shadowy histories of domination, force, and violence of the other myths. Myth for Cavadini is imperial ideology in narrative form. Its gods are the extension of the bureaucracy of empire. John Milbank's different idiom, though perhaps to similar effect, argued that Augustine offers a counter-mythos to the ontology of life. Secular discourse as a myth can only be out-narrated, precisely because, I think, revealingly, in the opening pages of Theology and Social Theory, Milbank sides with Karl Lowe against Blumenberg in claiming the secular as constituted by theological heresy. In 1956, a young Robert Marcus positively reviewed a book by John McCrory on Baldwin's existential theology. Two years later, he published a rather more critical review of Paul Tillich's Dynamics of Faith, siding with Bart's concern about a generic phenomenology that sacrifices biblical faith on the altar of human concern. In the Augustine lecture that Professor Wetzel mentioned, Marcus, largely following on Maru and Edward Crenz, argued that Augustine, from the 390s forward, cast aside the myths which inspired the optimism of his contemporaries. Marcus concluded his lecture, after citing the historian Herbert Firefield, by telling us that Augustine's final disenchantment was with the myth of the Christian Roman. The lecture echoes themes from secular. After the close of prophecy, the whole period since the Incarnation, <coughs> the period between the time of Christ's coming and his second coming, everything is ambiguous. Augustine's great virtue was to break the spell of Christian enthusiasm for politics with a divine mission in history. Now, there is a charism in the church on hidden pilgrimage, mostly uncertain, ad hoc, and peaceful, Christians can kind of have hopeful protest, maybe symbolic creative love. But Marcus says, quote, these add nothing to the achieved totality of sacred history concluded in Christ. Their primary goal is to summon their actor to a decision. Christians should live in hope. 
this secularization of post-lapsarian politics and the homogenization of all history, Marcus famously anachronistically concludes, implies a pluralistic, neutral civil movement. And the, the resources of that chapter seven of Seculum reveal its world. Oscar Coleman, Carl Rahner, Jurgen Moltmann, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, Harvey Cox, Karl Barth, Reinhold Niebuhr, TSL. It was the world of Vatican II. The great reopening of the church to the world, throwing the secular into the hands of God. In his later retraction, Christianity and the Secular, dedicated to Pope John XXIII, Marcus admits that that world may now be made of the world. And he set out to defend a view of Christian mediocrity in dialogue with Taylor, McIntyre, Rawls, Milbank, Auerbach, O'Donnell. He backtracks a bit, but perhaps like Augustine, ever so slightly. Mainly for giving the impression that Augustine was a modern secular liberal. But he still maintains the eschatological character of secularity for Augustine is a stance of patience in the face of hope. For the mature Marcus, the mature Augustine holds agnosticism about history and is opaque to us. This is celebrated as opening the door to a shared human cultural endeavor focused only on the things pertaining to this moral world. It admits religious visions of a cosmopolitan counterculture that Christians can learn from non-Christians and talk about things beyond theology. Indeed, uh, against social contract liberalism, Marcus emphasizes the need to maximize moral consensus in society, our common objects of love. Marcus thinks Christendom, after Augustine, was a bad thing because the church swallowed the world. And we need to preserve the spirit of Vatican II to open to the world. Now since Marcus, there's been a salutary turn to decentering the city of God, especially Book 19, and turning to other Augustine treatises and his letters, his sermons. These challenge aspects of Marcus's reading, I think, they keep questions of Catholicity and diversity alive. It does seem, for example, to me, that Augustine embraced Christian politics. He encouraged civil and military officials to use their office to promote Christian morality. Because we live after Christ in Christian times. Robin Mullen, in an article recently, argued that a Christian rhetoric of office holding developed across the Mediterranean, including Africa, the court in Ravenna, that would conceive of imperial service within an economy of divine providence. Augustine participates in this rhetoric as much as Isidore and Theodoret, even though he would emphasize it's complex to be a pilgrim bureaucrat of the empire. Now, historians are going to debate these matters, what it means for contemporary Augustine. <coughs> Much remains to be discovered, even in Book 19, I think, as Veronica Ogle has shown in her pairing of De Doctrina and City of God, to recover, recover Augustine's sacramental semiotics in ways that doesn't concede politics to the bright lights, yet ultimate darkness of the earthly divine city. But another largely untapped resource, I think, is Augustine's biblical commentary, the explosive raw material now, I confess I still enjoy the thrill of great outnarrations of modernity criticism, the tournament of biblical and secular myth. But I've come to think it might be wise, and certainly salutary, to come down from the heights of abstract political theology, hold off on stories that pull all the pieces of different epics together, and once again, emphasize concrete political and social analysis. We need applied political Augustinianism, but without losing the theological steam. Now, I've been read as a critic of Reinhold Niebuhr, and I am 
both of his statist interest group politics and his liberal theology. But even Stanley Hauerwas, who found his theology and ethics wanting to say the least, paving the way for a politics of dirty hands pragmatism that lets you do evil to achieve good as long as you feel sad about it, <laughs> admits that Niebuhr had astute political intelligence. Niebuhr might, for example, today worry that too much of a Christian enthusiasm for open borders policy about immigration fails to reckon with a host of empirical realities, wage deflation, ecological consequences, as well as the need for collective self-governance. But he didn't believe getting our facts right or another book debunking myths by distinguished historians would actually change our politics. As Hauerwas recently put it, Niebuhr could create, for those who heard him preach, a new reality. Like Martin Luther King and Abraham Lincoln, and Hauerwas and Milbank, and Augustine for that matter, Niebuhr could weave scripture and history to address concrete problems, not just register symbolic resistance. Now, like Marcus's liberal Catholicism and Niebuhr's mainline Protestantism, their world is not ours. Niebuhr wrote before the culture wars, the decline of the mainline, and today's resurgent opposition to liberal democracy as a threat to Christian morality. Niebuhr relished the, quote, permanent myths of the Christian revolution, which he said he took seriously, but unlike Augustine, not literally. He did this to create coalitions to combat the fascist right and the communist left. In a sense, he practiced casuistry as a narrative art, juxtaposing myths that nurture a way of life and using parables to stand in contradiction to them. He demythologized, to be sure, but he also deployed men against what he thought was the social science rationalism of his day, challenging the liberal pension for policy proposals that failed to inspire political mobilization. Cognitive psychologists and political scientists call this the storytelling gap that continues in our time, often dividing the left, which is good at identifying issues and policies, but not telling stories, and the right. Myth alone, Niebuhr said, is capable of picturing the world as a realm of coherence and meaning. Now, we should not rehabilitate Niebuhr's account of myth and history or his reading of Augustine and democracy. He tends to psychologize all social evil instead of historicizing it. But we could still learn rhetorically from his effort to translate the Christian narrative into actual politics. Maybe especially his effort to meditate on the weight of the past for present injustice. But in turning to my conclusion, I also want to say we should learn from his vision of a liberal international order against cosmopolitanism on the one hand and narrow nationalism on the other. It flowed from his reading of the Hebrew prophets, the wisdom literature, and New Testament parables. That politics that values the life world of nations, albeit not absolutely, was once seen as a great contribution of Jewish and Christian imagination. It was worked out in early modern international law, and in mid 20th century led to many transnational social movements that wanted to defend a universal world community, even as it recognized cultural specificity and bounded loyalty. Critics of liberal internationalism today claim that the juridical project obscures structural inequality, it masks legacies of capital, race, settler colonialism, that made liberalism possible. It is Smithian liberalism, to use a term. This view is especially common among those who see the United States as the prideful architect of a new empire, a new world order since 1945. At the same time, populism, think Trump and Brexit, are seen as responsive to the neglect of the local, a sense of place by technocratic cosmopolitan I think these two issues speak to the problem of liberal democracy today. How do we have a sense of national belonging? 
expressed in our debates over immigration, public education, religious liberty. Some speak of a new post-Christian, Christian nationalism, ethnic Christianism, analogies to Europe. It's the kind of thing that Augustinians are usually deeply suspicious of, civil religion. We like the true religion of the heavenly city. But beyond warnings of the idolatry of religious nationalism, affirmations of transnational churches, calls to regard no person as alien, often with very ethicized appeals to the parable of the Good Samaritan, Protestant and Catholic theologians have been rather timid in asking, what is a nation? Who are the nations? Who are the ethnic, the people? Especially given those who confess faith in the relational God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. There's been less focus on the theology of the nation, a topic that was a very important part of 19th and 20th century theology, but also late antique theologians, especially after the fall of Rome, wrestling with their identity, how they fit into the biblical drama of Israel and the nation. Peter Brown has aptly described these as micro Christendoms, where particular identities were seen as diverse incarnations of the church. If Oliver O'Donnell <coughs> asked us to reconsider the witness of Christendom, perhaps we might reconsider the witness of the Gentile nation. <coughs> Will the national histories be remembered, brought into the history of God when the whole of history is seen in the light of Jesus? Augustine's relentlessly negative position on civil religion is being rethought. He was a Roman after all. He lived in a world where the tight fit between ancestry, cult, and gods had once been very important. Early Christians wrestled with the charge that they disturbed all of this. They created the category of the Gentile, a new universal ecclesia, men and women of the spirit. They made Gentiles unintelligible by preaching equality in Christ shatters all other communities especially in a world that is passing away, according to Paul. The defeated nations count for nothing, Isaiah says. A mere drop in the bucket, a little dust on the scales of divine judgment. What matters is God and the soul. But if you read scripture, when God gathers all flesh, the Lord, the divine presence, it is as nations, returning to the 70 nations gathering the tribes. The psalmist declares the princes of the nation shall assemble. Zechariah imagines nations will be like a clan of Judah. The judgment against the nations is set within an eschatological vision of their redemption. Nations streaming to Jerusalem to worship together. With Israel, the only collective people of God called by name in the Bible. Long before post-colonialism, these strange creatures of spirit proclaim the nations belong to the old lady. The heavenly city is what really matters, Augustine said. But how did Augustine, given his views on Israel and its election and the diversity of laws governed by divine providence, read these passages of Gentile? <coughs> Augustine develops and reacts to Cicero's use of Roman history. It offers an intriguing, gradualist, biological model of history with analogies to the stages of human life. On my reading, at least, at the very least, it challenges demythologized, fully ethicized readings of the Bible, typically stated in universal opposition, <coughs> that fail to tend to Augustine's keen sense of the narrative character of temporal existence. Augustine had a sense of ethical urgency, to be sure, as Carl Pullman has pointed out, but it was always narrated in a particular history. Like in his call for Rome, not Greece, not Israel, to be converted in light of the imminent end of time in Book 2. Jeremiah's oracles against the nations distinguish those that will be given a place and those that will not. How might an Augustinian today read those biblical passages in light of the question, what is a nation? There's a lot of nation talk in the Bible. Augustine is no stranger, as we saw in books 15 to 18. There's 4,000 references to the Kentes in Augustine's corpus. 
He talks about Noah's Ark as prefiguring the church of all nations, even assigning the angels of the people. And as Acts 17 puts it, distributing the nations with their appointed time in history and the boundaries of their land. We know the toxic use which this kind of thinking has led to. Acts 17 was the favorite verse of lost cause segregationist theologians in the American South. The pro-apartheid doctrine of the church. It's one of the favorite verses of Pastor Robert Jeffress, who in his inauguration day sermon for Donald Trump, <coughs> voted and Nehemiah to claim that Trump was rebuilding the walls of a godly nation. Maybe demythologizing isn't so bad. But must we only demythologize, content to distinguish nationalism is bad and prideful, enlightenment, patriotism, mostly of ideas, is good? That subtly reproduces another myth, the supersessionist myth, Christian universalism against Jewish particularism. America may be a nation with the soul of a church, as G.K. Chesterton famously put it. But it's hard to be a nation of abstract ideas. As much as it appeals to my intellectual cosmopolitan side, enchanted by the Christian story of a universal kinship that Augustine used in warning Christians not to baptize being Roman, but an alternative to an unrelenting critique of nation <coughs> by the apologizers and the political myth of far right nationalism is a remythologized version of the international order centered on a Christian vision of Augustine's two cities. Now fortunately for me, and perhaps for you, I am now at the edge of time in this lecture. Let me just end by repeating the basic point. Political theology invites inquiry of the sort we used to call theology. Such inquiry might yield an Augustinian political theology that is more theological because it raises fundamental questions distributed across theology proper from creation to Christology to eschatology and ecclesiology, but also more political because when confronted by the realism of the scriptures, a divinity that is not afraid of humanity or exclude our history, it forces us to turn from abstract discussions of sovereignty, secularity, and neutrality to the embodied lives of people. Silence about the shape of history may be a form of mourning, a grieving without adequate words or concepts, given the pernicious legacy of efforts to think about the shape of history and then try to impose it on other people. But if political theology in all its plurality is not able to engage questions about history in modes other than critique, demythologizing as it is sometimes practiced, it risks becoming another provincial academic discipline. The prophetic no must be premised on some sort of eschatological yes, as Luke Brotherton reminds Augustine. Historians and philosophers, not to mention anthropologists and others, have found themselves in the emerging interest in political theology and secular studies. It would be a shame if theology and its varied accounts of history remain excluded by the secular formations of religion and politics, even ones that Augustinians themselves created. Let me end here. 800 years after Augustine, Thomas Aquinas, one of the great Augustinians, in his commentary on Aristotle's metaphysics wrote, because philosophy arises from all, a philosopher is bound in his way to be a lover of myths and poetic fables. Poets and philosophers are alike in being big with wonder. Augustine, for all his doom and gloom, for all his sadness, for all his world weariness, was, if anything, big with wonder. Our political theology should aspire to be the same. Thank you.